podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Sports Social, now on the Sports Social Podcast Network. It is a huge summer for English cricket and the Sports Social Podcast Network is here to hold your hand and guide you through the action. Myself, Melissa Story, and my co-host, Nikki Chowdhury, will be following the England women's progress as they take on a terrifying Australian team, bringing you post-match roundups and discussion and even a few exciting guests. Search for the analyst inside cricket to find Storylines, the women's cricket podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. Welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of iNews.co.uk and the I newspaper. I've still got Calvin Bett on here um, because who's who's currently fiddling so much that I can hear it on my headphones. Calvin, this is the main one of the main things about our new recording system is I can hear Calvin's inability to sit still. Um, what I can recommend, Calvin, is if you find something to grip onto, it'll make it easier. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to look back at Tuesday's action at Wimbledon, uh, which was the first day of quarterfinals, down to two courts. I always think it's a bit like when the World Snooker Championship goes from two tables to one table, the uh, quarterfinals day at Wimbledon, because it, it gets a little bit more rarefied. Um, the outside courts are mostly just sort of the Bryan brothers and Mansour Bahrami messing around, um, and the two biggest courts in Wimbledon are very serious tennis indeed. I think the biggest story of the day by a distance was Alina Svitolina beating world number one Iga Svantec. Uh, the level in this match wasn't always very high but the drama certainly was. Iga Svantec hit 41 unforced errors. I think 26 of them came on her forehand wing. She lost the first set. Uh, she then clawed it back uh, the second in a tie break. Uh, in which she appeared to find some form on the forehand, but then Svetlana roared back to take the final set 6-2 and the double break uh, and seal her first place in the semi-final since the 2019 US Open. She's the first wild card to make it into the women's singles semi-final since Sabine Lezicki in uh, 2011. Uh, Calvin, you, you were convinced that Shontek would drag this back, even when Svetlana was a set-up. Uh, sorry, a, a breakup in the deciding set, and she didn't. What 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 do you think was the key to this match? I mean, I didn't see any of the third set, so right. I, I've, I only followed the score. I watched the end of the second set, and it just felt like they felt like then, like it did the other day when Schwantek beat Benchich. Yeah, saved two match points. Yeah. yeah, it felt like that there was a window that the the other girl had to win it in. And the window had passed. Mm. Um, but Svitolina was straight back on it. Didn't seem to affect her losing. Being so close. I think she was two points from the match. I don't yeah, think yeah. she had a match point, did she? In the second set. She was 4-1 up in the in the t- second set tie. Yeah, 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 yeah. But didn't, I don't think she had a match point. No, um, she didn't. I mean, 4-1 in the tie break is a bit misleading sometimes because there's two serves to come. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's only a one. It's only a mini break, 4-1. Yeah. Right? Um, but... Um, yeah, but she she must have played a hell of a third set. Mm. I don't. I, the second break was the key. Yeah. I mean, with with Svitolina who doesn't have a huge serve, I found it. I think you you guys were texting me during when I was just following the score, mm. and I found it hard to believe that Svitolina would hold serve yeah. for the rest of the match. Now I thought that she could have maybe got broken back and then break again, but I, I still thought Svantec would win it. Yeah. But once it got two breaks, then you know. Mm. Then it gets you get you're a lot closer. Well, especially uh, I um I know you don't get on with Craig O'Shaughnessy, Calvin, but he did point out to me an interesting stat uh, before this match, which is that Iga Shontek had broken in I think 16 of the 24 service games she had faced, which is a a 64% strike rate on breaking, which which when you think about it is colossal. That was at Wimbledon so far this year. Um, and she did, you know, there were a lot of breaks, decent number of breaks to serve in this match as well. I haven't got the exact number in front of me. But nevertheless, I think this is, and this is kind of what I was alluding to um, in an earlier podcast, is the the resilience that Svitolina has shown over this tournament. And she talked about it afterwards. She said, 
war has made me a stronger person. War and having a child has made me look at things differently. And I do think in the women's game where, you know, it is a bit more up and down, where the mental game seems to play a bigger role at the moment for whatever reason, probably because of lots of inexperience at the latter stages of the Grand Slams. But she has this kind of steeliness and, and just resilience. Like As you say, Calvin, she she got thumped in the second half of that tie break. Shontek seemed to have found her forehand. And then she comes out and she breaks virtually straight away. I think she broke at one all to take a lead that really she never gave up in the third set. Um, it's This is not the Alina Svitolina that we previously knew she before going away and having a baby she was like this was the Alina Svitolina who played well at events that we didn't take much notice of and when it came to Grand Slams she'd be a high seed have an easy draw and lose early yeah um a problem was always that she never really had any weapons she'd make a lot of balls mm. but wouldn't wouldn't have any of the weapons to finish players finish the big players off which is another reason why I didn't think she'd win today but um yeah, she's. I mean, I don't think she's particularly hitting more winners, to be honest. But no, um, she just seems to be not not messing up as often. I guess I, I think she's playing smart. I, I, and again, I'm a layman in terms of tennis, but just from watching her live, and Shontek mentioned it afterwards. Actually, she said, "Oh, I played her in Rome in 2021, and it didn't feel like that." I practiced with her in Australia and I don't remember her changing the rhythm and pace of the match this many times. And actually, that's what I kind of notice about Shanta uh, Svitolina during this tournament is, yes, she does try and counterpunch and yes, she makes a lot of balls. But as much as possible, she doesn't give you the same ball twice. Like she can flatten out her backhand. She can hit her backhand quite high and spinny and she will do that in rallies so that it's quite hard Especially, I think, for someone like Shontek who likes to rally and who likes to get into a rhythm. I think it's quite hard against Svitolina to get into that rhythm and, and really, you know, pick up the ball that she gives you because she gives you so many different types of ball. And I think probably, and th this is where I think I might get you on side, Calvin, in the women's game, there are there isn't a lot of that. There are a lot of people who do like to hit the same ball, you know, hit it quite flat, hit it quite hard and just try and outpower you. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I mean, that, and I think that is something that she's maybe added to it. I noticed today that she 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 said, I don't know, it was in a press conference after or before it, that she said that while she was out with her pregnancy, her and her coach spent a lot of time reviewing and analysing her game and that of the opponents and what she needed to do to come back and win. Mm. And I think that's, you know, that's of huge value that they've done that because, yeah, you know she's she's being she's certainly being the big players now. She beat the best player in the world. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I guess let's um, let's see what what comes next. Mm. Um, I mean, I thought that the match that she played against Azarenka, although the, the tie break was full of drama. Yeah, the standard in it, bar maybe the last ten percent, was absolute garbage. Well, yeah, the, and, what was it? First twelve points of that tie yeah, break were unforced first, errors. Yeah, the first twelve points were unforced errors. Um, and then there were a good few more after that as well. Mm. At the end of the tie break, there were some good shots, to be fair. But um, but that's kind of what the ma they're the matches that Svitolina's going to win. Yeah. If that's what you're getting, um, you know, it's, if 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 you say the first the first twelve points were all winners, then you'd think that Svitolina was probably you know nine three down mm. or something. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the big test. You know, she's got Marketa Vondrasova, who beat Jessica Pagula in a very tight match on court one um, today. She's got Vondrasova in the semis, who, who you'd think, you know, I don't think she'll necessarily fear in any way. I'm not quite sure what their head-to-head -head record is, but, you know, I don't think Vondrasova... The problem really is going to come, and, and look, from, a, from so many different perspectives, I hope we get this final, which is Sabalenka versus Svitolina. Because, like... That that is that is the final I think we want. It's the one that will create the most interest in the women's game. It, it's a, I think a decent contrast in styles. Um, I, I worry that Svitolina might get blown off the court by her. Um, but there's also of course the the Ukraine Belarus thing, and you know I, I think it would do a great job of again like putting the plight of the Ukrainian people at the centre of the tournament. 
And, you know, we've talked a lot on this podcast about having the Russians and Belarusians back at the tournament. And we can't deny they've added a huge amount. Mira Andreeva, Azarenka, Sabalenka, Roman Safiulin, who got to the quarterfinals, Andre Rublev today against Djokovic. They all added loads to the tournament. Medvedev's still in. And Medvedev, of course, who is still in. Um, but it, it also, on the other shoe on the other foot, is that this war is still going on. Now, letting the Russians and Belarusians play, I don't think has changed people's opinion of, of the war or anything like that. But I think Alina Svitolina playing a final against Arena Sabalenka, she won't shake her hand afterwards. I think it'll remind everyone what's going on. And, you know, I think the war's taken a bit of a back seat, really, in, in the news agenda. And, you know, it's still going and it's still not nice. The people of Ukraine are still dying in their droves. There are still war crimes being committed. And I think Svitolina, you know, she's a proud Ukrainian citizen and she's proud to put her country on the map. And I think that final would, <laughs> it would certainly put Ukraine on the map um, in an even greater way. And, and look, uh, of course I want it to be about tennis, but t- tennis doesn't matter very much. Uh, yeah, it'd be, um, the problem is that you'd, you'd make Sabalenka a favourite. And that's nothing against Sabalenka, but it's, I don't know how how much good publicity it would be when the Belarusian, if the Belarusian just end up clubbing her, which could happen. Hell of a story. <laughs> from from a news perspective, I mean, God, there's going to be a lot to be written about it, I'll tell you that. I, say, I don't think it'll happen. I think Rabikina will be in the final. So. Mm. Which also has some intrigue, because <laughs> Rabikina obviously is Moscow-born, but you know, flies the Kazakh flag now. Anyway, yeah. uh, much going on in the women's game, as always. Um, following that shock on centre was, well, what looked like, very briefly, it might be another shock, uh, because Andre Rublev won the first set against Novak Djokovic. Um, unfortunately, as I pointed out to my colleague, all Andre Rublev was doing was wasting all of our time and making sure that I got home an hour later than I was supposed to, uh, because he was never going to win this match. Like, don't get me wrong, I really like Andre Rublev, and I think he's a pretty good tennis player, but he's now lost eight out of eight quarterfinals, and, like... I have never seen Novak Djokovic so relaxed on a tennis court. Like there was one point where he was serving at five four in the second, the third, sorry. So at this point, like it's still one set all, and the game went to six juices. Uh, he saved multiple break points. Rublev saved multiple set points, and Djokovic was just laughing. Like there was one point where Rublev like had a grunt, and Djokovic grunted back at him mid point. It was like an exhibition match. And then Rublev won the point, and Djokovic was like, lol. And I genuinely think it was, in his head he was like, well, this is all kind of irrelevant, because there's absolutely no danger I'm losing to this bloke. He's not scared of him, Calvin. No, he, he knows he's beating Rublev. <laughs> like, he just, you know, it was something would have to go terribly wrong for <laughs> for, the, for that not to happen. And, you know, it's the problem with Rublev is you know exactly what you're getting. Mm. Like, he's not really going to... He's. He, He's never really going to play out of his skin, and he's not ever really going to play terribly. Although, yeah, it's more likely to play terribly than play out of his skin. Mm. Um, There's and... so many rallies today where he's just like hitting neutral balls back at Novak Djokovic. Yeah. It's like, how do you think this is going to end? Yeah, um, and there's a point where he had, a, he had a break back point in the third or fourth set. Mm. And he, you know, he got to the break back point and the hands in the air, revving the crowd up, and then yeah. he just hit a rubbish backhand line like about a foot long, mm. like, and it was like, well, you know, what was, what the was point all in that, that for then? Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, I felt like that for basically the last two hours of that match, where I was like, what's the point in this? Like, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, like, the, no, there's no jeopardy. He wasn't, he was never going to win that. And I, f- I feel, like I say, I feel really sorry for Andre Rublev because he genuinely seemed like... I interviewed him at the Boodles um, just before Wimbledon and he's so self-effacing, you know, he's that you kind of what you see is what you get. Like, there doesn't seem to be much, you know, um, kind of facade there. You know, he likes One Direction and he, we had to explain to him what a scone was because for reasons that I can't really remember, but he wouldn't, he couldn't understand the concept of a scone. And Faye, who runs the media at Boodles, had to go and get a scone. And he sort of inspected it, you know, like like when someone says, oh, I've caught a bug, and they bring it up in their hand, and he sort of goes and, like, stares at it really closely <laughs> and then just walks off slightly bemused. Uh, honestly, like, he just seems a really nice guy, and he's a pretty good tennis player, but, I mean, 
he's just a pretty good tennis player. Like he, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean that, that's probably underselling it a little bit. Pretty good tennis player. He's one of the top seven tennis players in the world. Yeah, like, like so, you know, if, in any other profession, if you were one of the top seven in the world, you'd be referred to as being absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Well, and, yeah, and he yeah. is. You know, he but is, that's the thing with but... Djokovic, isn't it? He can make really, really good tennis players look really blooming average. Yeah. Um, the, the problem is, there's not been many players like. There's basically no, no, there has. There's basically two types of top ten, twelve tennis players. There's the ones who, whatever ranking there are, they will just they'll just never beat the guys who are above them hmm. because of the, the the way that they play. And Rublev's like one of those. Yeah. Or you get the guys who. I guess like Felix or Ger Aliassim, who will have some absolute stinkers, but he can yeah. also beat anyone in the world. The sort of high ceiling guys rather than yeah. the consistency guys. Yeah, and, you know, that's what you'll get. But then again, you know, Andre Rublev's here on in the quarterfinals of Wimbledon. And quarterfinals? Yeah, it was, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, quarterfinals, yeah. yeah. Um, in the He's quarterfinals in the last eight club. Yeah, and all those other guys are not. Yeah, I know, mean... So. It, I guess maybe you know Novak Djokovic can't last forever, and there there is going to be a, a time when he plays someone who isn't Novak Djokovic or Nadal or Chilich in the quarterfinal. But I don't know. Eventually, he will win a quarterfinal. You know, he's the first man in the Open era ever to lose his first eight quarterfinals in Grand Slams, which is. I mean, he's been in eight, which is yeah. You know, that's it's good. Pretty impressive. <laughs> eight, eight. Eight memberships of the last eight. But... <laughs> well, yeah, they weren't all at Wimbledon, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, you know, he, he'll be back at Wimbledon for life, so that's that's something, unless they ban Russians again, or he can't get a visa. It's actually a good point. I don't know if Russians... Cause, so Russian media are banned from Wimbledon, but there's nothing to stop Russians buying a ticket, I suppose. Yeah, this might be something I'd look into, see if there are any Russian fans at Wimbledon. I sort of assume there are, but I haven't heard much from them. They're hard to see because they're not allowed a flag or... A Russian football shirt or anything that <laughs> denotes they're Russian, so quite hard to track them down. Um, but speaking of Russians, I should just, I, I kind of mentioned it, Roman Safiulin made his first ever Grand Slam quarterfinal. I mean, I say first ever Grand Slam quarterfinal, but he also made his first ever Grand Slam third round, fourth round, and quarterfinal because, he, you know, he, he's one of these guys who really has never made an impact on Grand Slams before. Um, and he's won four Challenger titles and about 12 Futures titles. And he's finally made a bit of a breakthrough, which, you know, he's going to go up 50 places in the world rankings, but um, he lost in four sets to Yannick Sinner, which I think is no great surprise to anyone. Um, sorry, Cowan. You, no, I wasn't going to say a anything. funny no. Roman Safiulin story, have you? No, no. no. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> no, it's been like nice. I mean, it's been a good draw for Sinner, hasn't it? Oh, my God. I, I cannot tell you how good his draw has been. I mean, to be fair, to counter that, he has played every single day of the tournament, I'm pretty sure. Mm, yeah, so he got held over he, several he's, times. He's currently in his... Like, seems to be currently in his 12th round. Um, <laughs> yeah, but he's literally, like, honestly... I, I don't even have to look up his draw because I've been through it several times with other people being like, have you seen this? Because he played Juan Manuel Cherenolo in the first round, who isn't even the best tennis player in his family. Diego Schwartzman, who obviously hates grass more than, uh, you know, I don't know, someone with really bad hay fever. Quentin Alice, who is French, which is basically a handicap. Uh, Daniel Galan, who is also like 75% clay. And then Roman Safiolin, who's never been past the second round of a Grand Slam. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, now he has to play Novak Djokovic in the semi-finals. <laughs> yeah, so... It's quite a big upturn, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, in terms of level, he's going to need he's gonna need to wake up. It was two sets to live up on him last year, wasn't he? Yeah, but that never means anything with Novak. Like, yeah. it's just, you know, he's just playing possum, isn't he? He's just, he's just waiting to decide when he, uh, when he wants to start playing tennis. I mean, yeah. honestly, like, he, I'll tell you what was interesting about Djokovic today after the Rublev match. Not only during the match was he more relaxed than I've ever seen anyone on a tennis court in a quarterfinal, but afterwards, you know, he equaled Roger Federer's uh, all-time men's record for Grand Slam semis, 46. And he sort of, he always shrugs off the records and says he's just engaged in the tournament he's in. And then, um, who was doing the interviews? Lee McKenzie said, oh, you know, all these young guys, they're coming for you. They, they all want to beat you. How does that feel? And he said, oh, yeah, I know they're trying to beat me. I know, I know they're trying to get my scalp, but it ain't happening. And I was like, even for Novak, who's a pretty self-assured guy, that was like staggeringly kind of swaggering. I, the, I mean, honestly, it, I, I don't think I've ever seen him this comfortable. 
in in anything. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it, it, you can kind of be like that because there's never really, as I can't remember him being in a tournament where he's so much the favourite. I don't think so. as, as he is now, you know. I mean, I mean, I do think there's a. I'm, I'm interested to see if he plays Alcaraz in the final. Yeah, I am, um, because I don't think that's a gimme by any stretch. But, and I think Alcaraz, you, you know, he, he'll, he'll have learned from the French Open, mm. uh, and, and the more matches he keeps on getting, the better he's going to become on the grass. The movement doesn't seem to be an issue for him, um, you know, and he's he's beating good players as well. You know, Berrettini's no mug. Yeah. On a grass court. He's been in the final at Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, has he been in it twice? No, just once. Was he? Right, okay. But he's won um, Queens twice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, that, I think that... But when you look at it, you know, there's normally somebody around who you think, you know, that could be an awkward one for Djokovic. Apart from that year when... No, even that, like that year when he beat when Kevin Anderson in the final, he beat Nadal in mm. a thriller in the semis didn't he yeah two day thriller in the semis yeah. which which everyone still claims was because he insisted that they kept the roof closed for the second day of it but I mean yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want to rake over that old ground partly because during the first half of that match I was nursing one of the worst hangovers of my life um, I, I was I, thinking about that well, I don't get the rule with this that, that you know you can't reopen the roof have they changed that now Can yeah that so now? I, I can't remember the exact and I tell you what the fact that we've even started to, talking about this guarantees that it'll be like Crocs versus Rafa Nadal fans in the mentions of this podcast. But anyway, um, now the rule is it's an outdoor tournament and wherever possible the roof will be open. So, for example, when Murray played Sitsipas this year, they obviously finished under the roof on the first night because it was 11 o'clock. Yeah. But then the next day the weather was fine and, and we, I asked Murray about it the next day after the match and he said we were told it was an outdoor tournament. I wasn't really given any choice. Because I'm sure, given the choice, Murray would have rather the roof was shut again. But that um, wasn't, wasn't... Yeah, that but hard. then again, I don't get why... If if you can start a match outdoors, and then it goes to indoors, I don't get why you can't start a match indoors and then it goes to outdoors. Well, you can. I mean, that that's the point now. But there, I, I think... I, I can't remember now off the top of my head, because as I say, I was super hungover. Um, I think the rule was understood to be that once they shut the roof, it had to stay shut for the rest of the match. Um, and, and that certainly is what happens, like, you know, it, but it's really just practical when it rains. So if it rains and you shut the roof and then it stops raining, you don't then stop the match again for 25 minutes to open the roof. But that's just that's just practicalities. Um, so, yeah, it. It wasn't a great moment, let's put it that way. Um, right, Calvin, it's getting late, which means I have to ask you for predictions for tomorrow, which is Wednesday. Um, uh, scores on the doors, George 61 points in our predictions game, which is currently just for podders, but maybe in the future we'll open up to other people. Calvin, 56 points, five points back, and then I've got a total as well. Um, but it's it's not relevant. Um, yeah, George had quite... Well, no, you had a good day, Calvin. You got four points to George's two. Um, so you've, you've gained some ground on him there um, because your your Djokovic in four prediction was very good, um, but that was that was about it unfortunately because we all picked Svontek and we all picked Pagula. Anyway, yeah. uh, let's start with Jabur versus Rabakina. You can go first. Uh, I think Rabakina will win that in two. Yeah, I I'm kind of with you. I think Rabakina will win. I think in three. I think there's a blip in, in there somewhere. And Jabur's playing pretty well. Um, she is. The, the next match on centre is Alcaraz versus Runa. Uh, I'll go first on this one. I think Alcaraz in five sets. I think it, this has potential to be like the match of the tournament because they, they know each other very well. They know each other's games very well. They're, they're both pretty fun. Like, it, if you've got centre court tickets on Wednesday and... I know because I got centre court tickets uh, for a mate on tomorrow. Uh, it's a very good ticket to have. Who are you picking in that match, Calvin? Which one was that again? I lost Alcaraz it there. Alcaraz Runa. Um, I am going to go Alcaraz in five. That is the same as me. Um, it, it'll be a classic, won't it? Like It, it just has to be. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I hope Alcaraz wins. Um, and I hope that Runa really loses his shit as well. That'd be funny. <laughs> uh, 
less of a classic. Madison Keys against Arena Savalenka. Um, Savalenka win that in straights. Savalenka in two. Um, in straight sets. Yeah. Uh, I I I, th- I think you just lost me, but I uh, I genuinely thought that match was so boring that you just that was your face just reacting to it live, um, but clearly not. Uh, and then finally, I mean, I'm going Savalenka in two as well. I think. Uh, finally, Medvedev versus Eubanks, the last match on number one court. I'm going to go Eubanks. You know, going to yeah. take a punt here. I mean, you, I Eubanks think I think in four. I mean, I, I think I will have to take Medvedev in an effort to make up some points, but Medvedev in four, probably. I, I, my worry is it, it might be a slightly unpleasant match to watch because they've both got enormous serves, but hopefully yeah. hopefully, Eubanks makes it, makes it interesting. Um, brilliant. Well, Calvin, thank you very much for taking late night time to spend with us. Um, we will be back tomorrow, of course. Maybe I'll have George, maybe I'll have Calvin, maybe I'll have Mikey Hinks. Who knows? But most importantly, we will be here. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. Sports Social Podcast Network.